All right, so in this recording, what we want to do is introduce genetics formally. So we've gotten a lot of background talking about chromosomes and mitosis versus meiosis and what have you. And, you know, one of the underlying themes of meiosis was this idea that we really want to mix up the chromosomes. We want to promote diversity in the next generation. And ultimately, that, like I said before, is going to be the groundwork for evolution. But modern genetics was really conceived and founded with Mendel. So Gregor Mendel was uh, a monk, and he worked with pea plants. And so these are many of the examples that we'll use as we start to learn about basic genetics. Now, one thing that we need to stress here is the difference between phenotypes and genotypes. So what we're looking at here are phenotypes. These are physical aspects of the genome. The genotype is all the genes, the genetic information that you have. And so what Mendel looked at was differences in phenotype. He looked at purple flowers versus white flowers. He looked at the position of the flower on the plant, um, the color of the seeds, many things um, that he was able to determine or pass from one generation to the next. All right. So this is going to come back to the idea that we are diploid. And that diploidy means that one of the chromosomes that we have is from our mother and one is from our father. Now, remember, each of those chromosomes that are in a pair are called homologous chromosomes, meaning they have all the same genes. But remember, the same genes means they're the same genes for, in this case, for example, flower color. They, both of these chromosomes have the flower color gene on them. But it doesn't mean their DNA sequence is exactly the same, because the allele for purple flowers is different from the allele from white flowers. An allele is just a fancy word for saying a version or an alternate form of a gene. Both are the gene for flower color, but they're slightly different. In this case, one came from mom, one came from dad. And that is how we're going to see things passed on to the next generation. Now, when we look at these pairs of genes, we can start to develop more vocabulary. And so here's a pair of homologous genes, the red from mom, the blue from dad, and we see three different loci, right? So the P loci, the, a lo the P locus, the A locus, and the B locus. And what we do is we can say, oh, let's look at the P locus. The version of the P gene that we got from mom is exactly the same as the one we got from dad. So we have a capital P, a capital P. Now, the capital versus lowercase indicates dominant or recessive, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but these are two, these are the same version of the gene. So for the P locus, you would write the genotype would be capital P, capital P, both the same. It is homozygous. So this individual is homozygous for the P gene. Now, you can be an alternate form of the gene, the lowercase form of a gene. The A locus is um, little a, little a, and that's recessive. So this would be homozygous recessive versus the P gene, which is homozygous dominant. Now finally, when you compare and contrast homozygous to heterozygous, you see that you have two different versions of the gene on the two different chromosomes. So in this homologous pair of chromosomes, we have the B locus, where the B gene is, but the B gene that we got from mom is a big B. It's a dominant version of the gene. And the B gene that we got from dad is a little b. It's a recessive version of the gene. They're two different versions, and so we call it heterozygous. Right? So this is the terminology that we're going to need as we start to build um, our mechanisms for studying uh, genetics. All right? Now, let's pursue that idea of dominant versus recessive. So a dominant version of a gene will always mask a recessive version of a gene, right? So a dominant version of a gene, if you have it, you will always see it expressed in the phenotype, right? So remember, phenotype is the physical manifestation of the genes. So in this case, we started to, Mendel started to learn about this when he took purple flowers that were true breeding. It means that that purple flower came from a line of purple flowers that were all purple. There was never any other color but purple, okay? Which probably means, is a good indicator, that it's homozygous. Remember, Mendel didn't know anything about DNA, didn't know anything about genes. None of that was um, known at the time. So he was just talking about some kind of genetic unit, some kind of hereditary unit that was passed on. Now, the white flowers are also from a line of white flowers, nothing but white flowers. 
Um, so this is probably a plant that is homozygous recessive. So two homozygous plants, you cross them, each can give one copy of the gene they have for flower color. Because the purple flower only has the purple gene to give, it gives a, pr a purple gene. The white flower is white and comes from a true breeding line of white flowers. So it only has the white gene to give, the white version of the gene. And so this F1, or this filial generation, um, is going to have a copy of the big one and a copy of the little one. So a purple and a white. And it looks purple. All right? That means that that purple gene, the purple version, is dominant. That's the dominant allele. And you may think, oh, we've lost the white gene now. We can't have white plants. But if you breed then the F1 generation with itself, which you can do with plants, um, you will see that you get some of its children that are white. And in fact, it's a 3 to 1 ratio of purple to white. And that is consistent. So that says that there is some regular consistent mechanism that's going on here with these quote-unquote hereditary units. Now, if we superimpose our genotype on the same cross, we can see what's going on. Now again, the parent generation, you see the purple flower, its genotype is big P, big P. And the white flower is little p, little p. So again, the lowercase is indicative of being recessive. So both of these are the same gene, it's the flower color gene, two different versions of that gene. Big P is dominant to little p. Purple is dominant to white. If you cross them, you're going to generate gametes, right? So going from purple flowers, big P, big P, to that circle with the big P in it, that is the whole meiosis process, right? That's why we need to understand meiosis. Where did, how do we go from two big P's to one P? Meiosis. When you only have a big P to give, it doesn't matter how much you mix up the genes, big P is coming out in that gamete. If you're little P, little P, it doesn't matter how much you mix up the genes, if you only have little P to give, little P is what you get. So you combine a big P with a little P, and you get what's called that heterozygote, right? So you have a purple flower that's big P, little P. If you now have it go through meiosis, it's going to be a little different. Because half of the gametes that it makes will get the big P. And the other half of the gametes will get the little P. Why? Go review meiosis, right? It got one big P from its dad and one from its mom. As it makes gametes, there's a 50-50 chance Every time a gamete generated, it'll get a big P or a little P, because it can only get one or the other. And so of all the gametes it makes, half of them basically will have a big P, and the other half will have a little P. Now, if you let those sperm and eggs get together, you can do a little chart. Okay, It's called a Punnett square, and we'll practice this in lab and in class, um, making these and working with them. But it can quickly generate, then, um, kind of the results of that cross. So... If one plant, which is the mom, can make a big P or a little P egg, and the dad can make a big P or a little P sperm, the combinations then are big P, big P, big P, little P, big P, little P, or little P, little P. And that then is our 3 to 1 ratio that Mendel discovered. Okay? So, genotype imposed on phenotype. So let's look at this now when we break down those, that final generation. So when we look at the phenotypes, we see that classic 3 to 1 ratio. We can see that because that's the phenotype. But on a deeper level, the genotype is showing us that it's actually a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio because only one of those four is actually homozygous dominant. Two are heterozygous, and one is homozygous recessive. So the homozygous recessive is a great kind of plant because you can always tell what the genotype is. If it's white, it's got to be little p, little p, right? If it's purple, you don't know if it's big p, little p, or big p, big p, right? So because of that dominance factor, um, it could be masking a heterozygote having the uh, carrying the kind of the small p, the um, recessive version of the gene. Now, how can we test that? We do what's called a test cross, right? So let's say I give you a purple plant, you don't know if it's big p, big p, or little p, big p, little p. But if you cross it with a known genotype, then you should be able to get predictable ratios of offspring, right? So if the big P plant, sorry, if the purple plant is big P, big P, then all of its offspring are going to get a big P from it because it only has big P to give. And if big P is dominant to little P, the white gene, that means that 
all of its offspring will be purple. If it's big P, little p, it means half of its kids are going to get a little p. And because the white plant only has little p, little p to give, it's going to get a combination of little p, little p. And that's going to be half of the kids then are going to be white versus purple. And so by testing, by crossing these two plants, you can look at the next generation and learn about the parents. All right? Now the final note that I want to make about Mendel's work in this introductory level is um, the law of independent assortment. Right? So this is going to say that though we can have characteristics that are linked, we're not going to talk about that so much in this class, but we are going to look at what Mendel's experiment showed. And he said, wow, if I have, but what if I look at two characteristics at the same time when I'm crossing a plant? So, so far we've looked at just the flower color. And looking at just one trait, we call that a monohybrid cross, one, mono. So this now is an experiment that's called a dihybrid cross. I'm looking at two traits or two loci at the same time, right? Because each trait we're, we're making equivalent to a gene. Now, in this case, I've got a round yellow pea plant, or pea seed and, or a green wrinkled pea seed. Now, what you'll see is the symbolism that they used, the symbols they used, were big Y for yellow and little y for green. So y is, big Y is dominant, they went with Y for yellow. Big R for round, little r for wrinkled. Okay, little r is um, not dominant, right? It's recessive. So if these two genes were linked or controlled by the same, if these two characteristics were controlled by the same gene or if they were linked in some way, then you would predict what would happen on the left. That you would only get yellow with round seeds and green with wrinkled. But in fact, that isn't the case. Because you are, in fact, looking at two different loci. And the only way to know this is by doing the test cross or someone has to tell you. And again, in this class, we're not going to look at link genes. So whenever I give you a dihybrid cross um, to work with, you can assume safely that those are independent loci. Okay. So now what happens is you have to expand your Punnett square. You have to consider all the different combinations as we mix up the genes that could produce um, different kinds of gametes. So if I'm a big Y, big Y, big R, big R, and I cross it with a little Y, little Y, little R, little R, it's an easy cross because it's a hybrid that is heterozygous for both loci. Big Y, little Y, big R, little R. But if I self-cross that F1 generation or do a cross with another individual that is um, heterozygous for both loci, now I've got lots of possibilities. I could put a big Y with a big R or a big Y with a little R, right? Or I could put a little Y with a big R or a little Y with a little R. So now there's four combinations of these two genes that could, per that could come up in a gamete. And so now I've got a 4 by 4 uh, Punnett square with 16 possibilities. All right. And so again, you just once you line up the sperm and egg, then you just fill in the genotype as you combine them to get back to a diploid organism. And what you can see here is then you get a classic ratio for phenotype of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. All right. So this can get more complicated quickly, um, but this takes lots of practice. So this is like math problems. You just have to practice, practice, practice. You have to do them again and again and again. And I guarantee you before you're done with this stuff, you'll be doing these Punnett squares in your head without having to write them out.